Hello and welcome to lesson six of 20 in the URSA campus breakdown course on introductory statistics and probability. This is module one, introduction to statistics, part six, descriptive statistics, summarizing numerical data sets. Let's get started. In the previous lesson, we looked at the frequency of occurrence of values or groups of val values within data sets and how this information can be presented in frequency and relative frequency tables and bar graphs and histograms as well. In this lesson, the focus is on how the distribution of values within numerical data sets can be summarized in both numerical and graphical forms. We'll look at five number summaries box plots, outliers and modified box plots that can be generated from those. And finally, we'll look more generally at describing the overall shapes of numerical data sets. We start with five number summaries. A set of numerical data can be summarized with a five number summary based on the following measures in increasing order. The five number summary starts with the minimum value, which we call x min, and it ends with the maximum value, which we call x max. Now we've looked at these already, in particular when we were talking about the range, the mid range as a measure of central tendency and the range, which is a measure of dispersion. And those two measures use x min and x max. In between those, the five number summary also includes what are called the first quartile or Q1, the median or Q2, and the third quartile or Q3. And essentially what the five number summary does is it divides the data into quarters. And that's reflected in the names for Q1 and Q3, which are the first and third quartiles. And as we'll see, the median is the second quartile, um, as well as being the median, which is one of the measures of central tendency we looked at previously. Now, as we looked at previously, x min and x max are simply the first and last values when the data set is put into increasing order. And Q2 is the median value or the middle value of the ordered data set. And as we talked about previously, the median value is either the middle value of the data set when n is odd, or when n is even, it's the average of the two middle values. Similarly, Q1 and Q3 are the middle values respectively of the first and second halves of the data set. Now the calculation of these values is a bit less self-evident than for the median. And as a result, there are different variations of rules uh, commonly used by statisticians. The method used here in this course is a relatively straightforward one and works as follows. First, we consider whether the data set contains an odd or even number of values. If n is even, then there's no middle value. So the lower and upper halves of the data are obvious. If n is odd, however, then the middle value has to be excluded with the lower half comprising all the values below it and the upper half all values above it. From that, we get Q1 being the median of the lower half of the data set and Q3 as the median of the upper half of the data set. This method is illustrated in the following examples. So the first example we'll look at, example one, is based on a data set of heart rates in, measured in beats per minute or BPM for a group of 11 randomly selected adult walkers. So we see the raw data here and we rearrange it into increasing order. And we see we have a data set of values with a low of 53 and a high of 97. So our five number summary for this data set uh, is calculated as follows. So we start with the easiest, which is X min and X max being the lowest values, 53 and 97 respectively. 
Next, we look at the next easiest thing to calculate is the median, or Q2. So to do that, we look at the fact that the sample size of 11 is an odd number. So we use the rule for that. So we go 11 plus 1, which is 12, divided by 2 is 6. So the median is the sixth value, which is 78. Now, to find Q1 and Q3, we need to look at the lower and upper half. So we first have to consider, again, that this sample size is odd, which means that we'll have, uh, if we exclude the median, we take that out, we end up with 11 minus 1, which is 10 remaining values, and we divide that by 2. So that gives us five values in each of the lower and upper halves. And you can see on the slide here, we partition the data set to exclude the median, and then we have an, a lower half and an upper half each of size five. Now, n lower and n upper are both five, which is also an odd number. So we use the same method to get the, the value of Q1, which is the median of the lower set. So five plus one is six divided by two is three. So we take the third value from the left to get the middle of the lower half, and that is the third value, it's 73. And to get Q3, we start on the right this time, and we count the third value starting from the extreme right, which is 83. So our five number summary here would be X min is 53, Q1 is 73, Q2 is 78, Q3 is 83, and X max is 97. Example two, is a similar data set. It's also a set of heart rates and BPM, but this time the number of people sampled is 13. So we have the data set which we convert into increasing order. We rearrange it into increasing order, and we can see here we have values ranging from 54 to 107. So we proceed similarly. We, we can figure out quite quickly that we have uh, our X min and our X max are 54 and 107 respectively. And next we figure out our median, Q2. And we see that once again, we have an odd number, 13. So we go 13 plus one, four, which is 14 and divide by two, which is seven. So the seventh value in the data set is our median and that is 78. Now we proceed to figure out our Q1 and Q3, and this time when we subtract, because n was odd, we take away the middle value, the median of 78, and that leaves 13 minus 1 or 12 values, and when we, when we divide 12 by 2, we get 6. So now our n lower and our n upper are 6, which is an even number. So to get the medians of those lower and upper halves, we have to use the the rule for an even number, which is to find the two middle values. So we go six divided by two is three, and then we add one, so it's the third and fourth values that we're going to average. So Q1 is the average of the third and fourth values starting from the left, which are 73 and 75, so we add those, divide by two, and we get a, a Q1 value of 74. And similarly for Q3, we start on the right and we get the third and fourth values from the right, which are 88 and 85. We average those, we add them and divide by two and we get 86.5. So for this data set, our five number summary is X min is 54, Q1 is 74, Q2 is 78, Q3 is 86.5, and X max is 107. Example three, again, a similar example. This time, we have heart rates in BPM for 14 adult walkers. And we, when we rearrange them into increasing order, we can see that we have values ranging from a minimum of 61 to a maximum of 87. So X min is 61, X max is 87. Now we have an even number of values. So to get the median Q2, we go 14 over two is seven. And so it's going to be the seventh and the eighth values. And we take the average of those two. This is one of those examples where both the seventh and the eighth values are 81. So obviously our median Q2 will be 81. 
And now to figure out Q1 and Q3, we proceed. Now, since we have an even number in the overall data set, we just we don't have a median to exclude. So we simply divide 14 by 2, which is 7. So we've got a lower half of the first seven values and an upper half of the upper seven values. So since n lower and n upper are seven, that's actually an odd number. So to get Q1 and Q3, we simply find the middle values of each of the lower and upper halves. Seven plus one divided by two gives us eight over two, which is four. So Q1 is the fourth value from the left, which is 70, and Q3 is the fourth value from the right, which is 85. So our five number summary is X min is 61, Q1 is 70, Q2 is 81, Q3 is 85, and our X max is 87. Our fourth and final example here is a sample this time of 12 adult walkers, and we have the heart rates in BPM, and we re when we rearrange them in increasing order, we have a data set ranging from 70 to 112. So the five number summary starts with X min being 70, X max being 112. We've got an even sample size of 12. So we take the two middle values, which is 12 over two is six. So the sixth and seventh values, we add and divide by two. 81 plus 84 divided by two gives us a median of 82.5. Now we, ex we then divide that even number by two, which gives us six values. So our lower and upper halves each contain six values. And those are even numbers. So we use the procedure for an even set to figure out Q1 and Q3. So six over two is three. So we take the third and fourth values from the left to get Q1 and they're both 75. So our Q1 is 75 and our Q3 is the third and fourth values from the right, which are also the same 88 and 88 so our q3 is 88 so our five number summary is x min is 70 q1 is 75 q2 is 82.5 q3 is 88 and x max is 112. next we look at box plots the the five number summary that we were just looking at can be displayed graphically and that's the purpose of a box plot so in this slide here, we can see a box plot, for example, one. Box plots are constructed as follows. You start by drawing a horizontal number line with a scale that captures the entire range of data values. So we start by drawing a horizontal uh, line, and you can see in the diagram here, our minimum was 53 for this data set and our maximum was 97. So for example, we could draw a number line with a scale starting from 40 going up to 120. So our overall box plot will fit in nicely in there. Next, we draw a box that starts at the Q1 value and ends at the Q3 value. So we have Q1 on the left and Q3, Q3 on the right. And we draw an additional line inside the box that represents Q2, which is the median. So that gives us a box with a vertical line inside. And we can see uh, that in the, in the completed box plot below, we can see that the box consists of the, uh, the leftmost value at 73, the rightmost value at 83, and the line in the middle of the box inside it um, of 78. So the way we finish off the box plot is to plot a very a smaller vertical line at the left end at the value of x min and a similar um, ver smaller vertical line at x max. We draw a line then going from x min to the box and then another line going from the so the line from x min goes to the left side of the box to q1. And then starting from Q3 at the right side of the box, we have a line that's extended until X max. And that gives you the completed box plot that you see at the bottom of this slide for example one. Similarly, the box plots are assembled for examples two through four, as you can see in this slide. A side-by-side -side box plot 
is simply two or more box plots that are plotted against the same number line for comparison purposes. So in this slide, we can see a side-by-side -side box plot comparing data sets one through four. In considering the overall distribution of values in a data set, we might be interested in identifying any values which might fall beyond what we might consider the normal range of expected values. These extreme values, which may be at either the low or high ends of the data set, are called outliers. Now, there's no single universally accepted rule for determining outliers. In this course, we'll use the following common method. First, we define the interquartile range, or IQR, which is simply the difference between the first and third quartiles. So the IQR equals Q3 minus Q1. Then we calculate the fenced area, which includes all non-outliers of the data set and is bounded by the following lower and upper fences. So the, formula, the formulas for the lower and upper fences, which form the boundaries of the fenced area, are as follows. The lower fence is equal to the Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR, and the upper fence equals Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. So we get the fenced area defined as the following closed interval which is the interval starting at Q1 minus 1.5 IQR and ending at Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. Now, as mentioned previously, there, there isn't one single universally accepted uh, rule for determining this fenced area, but the one that we're using here is one of the um, most common methods used and the formulas for the lower and upper fences is, is, are some of the more common ones used. So we'll use those in this course. Now, all data set values within the fenced area are considered non-outliers, while all values falling outside of the fenced area are, call, are, called, are considered outliers. So any values in the data set that are less than the lower bound or greater than the upper bound, <clears throat> upper bound would be considered outliers in that data set. So we now take a look at the data sets from examples one through four, and we test them for outliers as follows. Here's example one. So remember we had this example here uh, that ranged from a minimum, a minimum of 53 uh, to a maximum of 97. So we, our five number summary is 53, 73, 78, 83, and 97. So the first step is to calculate the IQR. So we take Q3 and Q1 and we subtract them. So our IQR is 83 minus 73 or 10. That's our interquartile range. So based on that, we calculate our lower fence by taking Q1 and we minus 1.5 the I, times the IQR. So that gives us 73 minus 1.5 times 10 or 73 minus 15. And that gives us 58. And the upper fence is equal to the third quartile Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. So we get 83 plus 1.5 times 10. That gives us 83 plus 15 or 98. So our fenced area is defined as all values going from 58 through 98 inclusive. So if we look at our data set here, we can see that all the values except for one fall within the fenced area. And the one value that's an outlier is colored and highlighted in red. We have a, a, the outlier 53. We call that a lower outlier. So that value falls below the lower fence of 58, and there's none of the values in this particular data set are fall above the, the upper fence of 98. So we have the one outlier of 53. So for example two, we similarly calculate an IQR. In this case, it's 12.5 and that gives us a lower fence of 55.25 and an upper fence of 105.25.
So that defines our fenced area. And based on those upper and lower limits, with this particular set of data, we can see that we've got two outliers. We've got a lower outlier of 54 and an upper outlier of 107. Example three, we have an IQR of 15 and a lower fence and upper fence that result of 47.5 and 107.5. So that defines our fenced area. Now in this particular example, our lowest value in the data set is 61 and that's greater than the lower limit of 47.5. And similarly, our upper, our maximum value of 87 falls within uh, the upper limit of 107.5. So in this particular example, we have no outliers and it's quite possible um, to have a data set with no outliers. And that's typically the result of a situation where the data set is relatively um, narrow, which this particular data set is compared to the other ones. And finally, we look at example four. That data set has an IQR of 13 with a lower fence of 55.5 and an upper fence of 107.5. When we analyze the data set here, we see that there are no values lower than the lower fence. So we have no lower outliers, but we have two upper outliers, 108 and 112. A variation on the box plot which distinguishes between non-outliers and outliers is called the modified box plot. The following are the distinct characteristics of modified box plots. Firstly, the areas to the left and right of the fenced area are shaded to show that these are the outlier regions. Next, if there are outliers on any side of the fenced area, then the end of that side's whisker is brought inward from X min on the left side or from X max on the right side to the furthest data value on that side that is within the fenced area. And finally, the outliers, which are now outside the box and whisker diagram and are located in the shaded areas are drawn as isolated points. So now we'll take a look at the modified box plots for examples one through four. In example one, we have a fenced area from 58 through 98. So we draw shaded areas to the left of 58 and to the right of 98. We have one low outlier of 53 and no high outliers. So we draw uh, the low outlier as a, an isolated point in red. So as we have a low outlier, that reduces the left whisker to the lowest non-outlier of 66, while since we have no high outliers, the right whisker is unchanged. In example two, we have a low outlier at 54 and a high outlier at 107. So this reduces both whiskers on the left to the lowest non-outlier of 72 and on the right to the highest non-outlier of 94. Meanwhile, in example three, there are no outliers on either side. So the only thing we need to do is draw the shaded areas, otherwise both uh, the box and whiskers are unchanged. And finally, in example four, we have no low outliers and two high outliers at 108 and 112. So on the left side, the, the left whisker is unchanged. On the right side, the highest non outlier is 88, which is actually, which happens to be Q3. In other words, in this example, all of the data values above Q3 are outliers. Therefore, the right whisker disappears. Now this would happen on the left side. The left whisker would disappear if all the values below Q1 were outliers. But in this particular case, it happens on the right side. 
it's possible in any data set of this type to to have either the left whisker disappear or the right whisker, or it's also possible for both whiskers to disappear. So finally, in this slide, we can show a side-by-side -side modified box plot for examples one through four plotted on the same axis. The last part of this lesson looks at how to describe the overall shapes of data sets and, and numerical data sets in particular. So in this part of the lesson, we take a step back from focusing on the minute details of five number summaries and box plots and outliers and modified box plots. Instead, we take a look at the bigger picture of how data sets can vary. So as we've seen in the previous lesson, when the values of a data set are plotted on a bar chart for nominal or ordinal data or a histogram for interval or ratio data, we get an overall view of the shape of the data, which is a visual representation of how the values of the data set are distributed in relation to each other. For interval and ratio data, continuous distributions are similar to discrete ones, except that continuous distributions, for, for continuous distributions, the number of possible data values is infinite. So whereas histograms that have finite numbers of rectangles or, or discrete rectangles, in continuous distributions, we replace that with smooth curves. So if you see in the slide here, the, the left diagram shows a histogram. So we've got a sort of countable, um, we have specific data values, each represented but with its own rectangle. And the frequency or relative frequencies are represented by the heights of those rectangles. If we're looking at continuous data, we would replace that set of finite set of rectangles with or discrete set of rectangles with a curve. And you can see how we're sort of we've superimposed this curve here over top the histogram to just sort of give a rough representation of the distribution of the discrete, the histogram data. And so we end up with uh, the diagram on the right, which is a continuous representation of the discrete uh, situation in the histogram on the left. For the sake of simplicity, the discussion which follows will consider all data sets in an overall sense with the data set represented graphically via smooth continuous curves such as the one in the diagram on the right here so whether we're looking whether we're talking about discrete or continuous data we're going to um, do the rest of our have the rest of our discussion in this lesson just treating all data sets and representing them with the sort of more general curved shapes so we'll start by looking at uh, one particular characteristic of data sets, which is, um, which, ref which looks at symmetry. So a, a data set is symmetrical if its distribution comprises two halves, which are mirror images of each other about some central value. So in this slide here, we see three examples of symmetrical data distributions. They're different in, in certain respects, but the one thing they all have in common is each of these three data distributions are, are symmetrical about some middle value. There's, we can draw a line in the middle of the distribution, a vertical line, about which would sort of be like a mirror, a mirror line. And the left and the right sides would be mirror images of each other. As the diagrams below illustrate, symmetrical data sets all have their mean, median, and mid-range values in the same central location where the axis of symmetry passes through. If the data set is multimodal, then pairs of modes will be located away from the center at mirror image locations to either side. And in these diagrams on this slide, what you see indicated as the mode or modes actually refers to the true modes versus the uh, any relative modes. And we have uh, two relative modes in the middle diagram. These are peaks but they're not the tallest peak, and that's discussed uh, in greater detail uh, later on in this lesson. 
Now we look at data sets that are not symmetric. If a data set is not symmetric, we call it asymmetrical. An asymmetrical data set is comprised of two sides that are not mirror images of each other. Most data sets, due to simple randomness, are asymmetrical. And the following are just a few examples of asymmetrical data distribution. So you can see that uh, it would be impossible for all three of these data sets to, to draw a vertical line anywhere such that the left and right sides would be mirror images of each other. Asymmetrical data sets are said to be skewed in the direction of the most extreme data. In other words, they're skewed in the direction of the, the values that are furthest from the median. So let's start with the an example that we looked at before of a symmetrical data set with one mode here. So we have the mean, median, mid-range, and mode all in the middle. The following are left skewed and right skewed variations of this distribution. So if we look at the left skewed data set in the diagram on the left, the mode is still located at the peak, but now we have the median, mean, and mid-range pulled in the direction of the skew, which in this case is to the left. And notice that the median is pulled the least amount in that direction, followed by the mean and then the mid-range. And then for the right skew data set in the diagram on the right, we see the exact same thing except in mirror image. We have the mode at the peak, followed by the median, then the mean, then the mid-range pulled to the right in increasing order. We now look at unimodal versus multimodal data sets. Unimodal data sets have a single mode, in other words, a single most occurring value. The diagrams below are all examples of unimodal data distributions. The diagram on the left is, show, is also symmetric while the other two are asymmetric. Of particular note, the diagram on the right has the mode at the far right end of the distribution, which is the maximum value. So this is an example where the mode can occur at either the minimum or maximum values, i.e. the left or right ends of the random variables distribution. Multimodal data sets have more than one peak. Now there are two broad categories of multimodal data sets. There's first what's, what's, what's known as generally multimodal data sets. These are data sets with two or more peaks, but only one of these is the tallest one. In other words, there's only uh, one most occurring value in the set, and we call this the true mode, whereas any other modes are called relative modes. So for example, we have two examples here below on this slide. The diagram on the left, we have a generally bimodal data set. So there's two peaks, but only one of them is the tallest. So the peak on the right, we call the true mode, whereas the other peak on the left is called the relative mode. And then the diagram on the right, we can count a total of four peaks and so we call this a generally four modal data set. There's only one true mode and the other three modes are lower and we call those three relative modes. Now, a truly multimodal data set has two or more tallest peaks of equal height. In other words, there's two or more equally most occurring values in the set so that these are the, these values are the true modes. So a truly multimodal data set may also have other relative modes. So in that situation, it's possible for a data set to be both generally and truly multimodal at the same time. So let's look at a few examples. The first diagram we see in this slide, we have two peaks and they're both the same height. So we would call this, we have, we would say that each of those our true modes, and we would call this a truly bimodal data set. The, the next one has, is similar in that there's three peaks that are all the same, so it's a truly trimodal data set. And the last diagram here is sort of a, a blended mixture of the first two. We've got three peaks, as in the second diagram, but they're not all the same height. 
However, two of them are, the two tallest ones are the same height. So we would say there's two true modes and one relative mode. So what we have here is a, is a truly and generally uh, um, multimodal data set. And the proper name for this is truly bimodal, generally trimodal data set. Uniform data sets are non-modal. In other words, they have all values occurring an equal number of times. Uniform data sets are all rectangular in shape. And since they're symmetrical, they have the same central value for the mean, median, and mid-range. So on this slide, we can see uh, some examples of uniform data distributions. They're all rectangular. The only real difference is some are um, wider and narrower than others. So you can see they're all rectangular in one way or another with this uh, a s axis of symmetry in the middle. That is the mean, median, and mid-range. Examples of data sets th that would be expected to be approximately uniform in the so-called real world include things like the distribution of rainfall or snowfall depth over a large a local geographical area. You know, for example, when you see that it snows and you go out into a wide open field, uh, you're likely that to see that the depth of snow would be the same uh, as you moved along, uh, you know, a distance in that in that field. So, for example, if you moved along a, a path over a short distance in a in a in a field after a snowfall, that you would expect the depth to be more or less the same. Another would be the height of blades of grass on a freshly mown lawn. Of course, you would expect that the blades of grass would be about as tall as uh, how low down to the ground the blade of the of the lawnmower went. And another example would be the number of times that numbers between 1 and 49 are chosen over an extended series of lottery draws. So assuming that um, if you've seen those lotteries where they put numbered balls into a machine and they randomly fall out of uh, the machine uh, to determine the winning uh, numbers, uh, we would expect that the number of times each of those individual numbers would be chosen should be roughly uniform. Otherwise, we might become suspicious that something unfair was going on. The following is a set of practice questions meant to provide a review of the material covered in this lesson. Question one, a study is conducted on the waste producing behavior of residents in two communities, Palookaville and Boomtown. A random sample of 40 residents is taken from each town with the average daily per capita amount of garbage generated in kilograms. The results for each town in increasing order are provided and we're asked to do the following. One, determine the five number summary for each town. Two, draw a side-by-side -side box plot comparing the data for the two towns. Three, determine the outliers in each sample, if any exist. And four, draw a side-by-side -side modified box plot comparing the data for the two towns. So this is an example where the sample sizes are 40, which is not only even and divisible by two, but it's also divisible by four, which means that the lower and upper halves are also even. So we use the even rule for figuring out all of the Q2, the median, and then Q1 and Q3. So that gives us for Palookaville, a five number summary of X min equals 0 0.00, Q1 equals 1.715, Q2 equals 1.985, Q3 equals 2.465, and X max equals 3.82. And for Boomtown, we get a five number summary of X min equals 0 0.014, Q1 equals 2.37, Q2 equals 2.60, Q3 equals 2.92, and X max equals 3.74. Next, we see the side-by-side -side box plot for the two towns, which is based upon the five number summaries just calculated. We now look for outliers, if any exist. Uh, working on Palookaville first, our first step is to calculate the IQR, which is Q3 minus Q1, 
which equals 0 0.750. With that, we calculate the lower fence, which equals Q1 minus 1.5 IQR, and the upper fence, which is Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. This gives us a fenced area from 0 0.590 to 3.590. And then looking at our order data, we can see we have three low outliers, uh, two at 0 0.00 and 0.26, and one high outlier at 3.82 for a total of four outliers. And repeating the process for Boomtown, we have an IQR of 0.55 and a fenced area of 1.545 to 3.745, which gives us just one low outlier of 0.14. Finally, we can uh, make our side-by-side -side modified box plot. The outliers are shown as isolated points here in red, and the whiskers are shortened accordingly where there are outliers. Note here that in the modified box plot for Palookaville, the lower outlier value of 0, 0.00 occurs twice. And the way we show this here is by plotting two points at this value at one above the other. Question two. For each of the following data set descriptions, draw a sketch of the corresponding distribution graph, which reflects all of the listed features. And note here that there's more than one different uh, graph possible for each case. So in the solutions that follow, uh, we'll, we'll show uh, two possible uh, correct answers. So for number one, we have truly trimodal and symmetrical. And the examples shown here, what they all, what they both have in common is that they each have three peaks, all of which are the same height and therefore truly trimodal. And the overall distributions are symmetrical. Uh, the, the, the center line going through the distributions goes through the the peak, the, the true mode in the middle in uh, both cases. Number two, asymmetrical, skewed to the right, and generally bimodal. So notice the two examples here. Uh, first of all, there's no, uh, there's obviously no symmetry, so therefore asymmetrical. The, the, the tail as it were, if we were to look at the lower part um, of, of the graph away from the center in, in both diagrams, it's to the right side, so therefore skew to the right. And each diagram has two peaks that are not the same, uh, the, not the same height, so we would say this, that these distributions are generally bimodal. Number three, symmetrical, truly bimodal, generally trimodal, and true modes at x min and x max. So first of all, both examples are, are symmetric, symmetrical distributions. We have a peak at the center, and there are two of the peaks are the tallest ones together in each example, so truly bimodal. There's a total of three peaks, so generally trimodal. And those, those two tallest peaks occur at x min and x max, therefore true modes at x min and x max. And finally, number four, asymmetrical, comprised of two distinct uniform regions and skewed to the left. So we have two diagrams here. Uh, first thing we can see right away that there's no symmetry, so they're asymmetrical. Uh, each diagram consists of two regions with a, with a gap between them, therefore distinct, and each region has a uniform height, has the same height across the entire region, so that's considered uniform, so we have two distinct uniform regions. Now for skew, in the diagram on the left, 
the the widths of the two regions are the same. So to so to determine the skew, we look for which of the two regions is is shorter, and that's the one on the left. Therefore, skew to the left. And for the diagram on the right, this time the heights of the two regions are the same. So we look for which region is narrower, and we see that that is the region on the left. Therefore, skewed to the left. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.